Now open your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, and I begin reading with verse 33. The title of my message today is The Word Test. Three words, the word test. And we'll see whether or not we can make a good grade on the word test. In verse 33, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, now watch this word here, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. I'd like to suggest, by way of introduction, that uh, Marge Schott and Jesse Jackson both need to read this scripture. It would help them very much. Don't you think so? Now, let's... I'm not going to talk about all of this uh, tripe that's been in the papers and all of this stuff, but I think all of us know that uh, it really isn't so much the words that a person says, but out of the heart are the issues of life. And we live in a society that is absolutely, totally saturated with hypocrisy today. And this is... Uh, I would have to say one of the things that is so destructive for our young people because our young people really don't have any heroes anymore. Uh, many of them have had the uh, rock uh, singers and you saw in the paper a few days ago about how that they fight the drug uh, habits and and uh, many of them like uh, Janis Joplin and, and uh, others have died uh, like the king, and I could go and call the roll. Most of them dying uh, before they're 50 years old. And uh, you understand that. And it's hard for these young people of ours today to have a role model like that uh, that will enable them uh, to live a productive, uh, meaningful life. So I want to talk about the word test. You know, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it said, By this, that is, by faith, the elders obtained a good report card. It doesn't put the card in there. I did that, but you understand. By it, the elders obtained a good report. So we have to stop and think about how people uh, judge us, how they look at us. Now, it says uh, the tree is known by fruit, and men are known by the fruit that they produce. Now, you, you find, uh, and let me get right into it in Matthew chapter 27. You find, if you want to go over there and look at it, in verse uh, 3, I believe it is, Then when Judas had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. And here's what he said, I have sinned, in that I betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. He cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, and he departed and went and hanged himself. You have here a man who is condemned. By his own words, he went to the uh, God-haters of that day and sold the Savior for 30 pieces of silver. And when the showdown came, he threw the money down on the floor in the temple, uh, perhaps at the altar, and went out and hanged himself. Uh, you have condemnation. A lot of people are condemned. You know, we need to understand the difference between conviction and condemnation. And I'm, that's the burden of this message. And by their fruits you shall know them. You know why a lot of people react like they react today? is because they are condemned. In John chapter 3 and verse 17, we learn that he that believeth not is condemned already, 
because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Condemned already. Every man, woman, boy, and girl uh, who has not received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Now watch the way I said this. This is clear for a whole bunch of things in your mind. What about the heathen? What about this one? What about that one? The Bible said, He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I don't care whether you're a Jew, Gentile, Turkish, Japanese, Chinese. Makes no difference. He that believeth not is condemned already. And that's why people react. They know they're condemned. Every atheist knows he's condemned. I think I have alluded to it on a number of occasions. I was doing some uh, work, uh, street work up in Lebanon some years ago. And uh, we had a conference. And then I was taking some young preachers out to show them how to do personal soul winning, personal evangelism. And I visited in a man's home. He was an educated man, had his degrees, a uh, physicist. And uh, I began to talk to him, and, and uh, I didn't get a word in edgewise. He just took over the conversation. I let him talk, and he condemned this Bible for everything that he could think of. And when he was finished, I said, is that all you have to say? Uh, and uh, I said to him, I said, would you mind telling me how many books uh, that we commonly refer to that make up the canon of Holy Scriptures? He didn't have that answer. I said, would you mind telling me how many verses, uh, many, how many chapters in the book of Genesis? And uh, I proceeded to ask him about a half a dozen, a dozen questions. And finally, he cursed me and said, I don't know a blanket a blank thing about that Bible. Get out of my house. And you know what I told him? I said, anybody that's of such moral degenerate, uh, degenerate in his soul like you are, uh, you don't have enough manhood to throw me out of your house. You know, and he didn't. You see, he was condemning a book that he didn't know anything about. He was condemned. That book burned him. I mean burned him. I had a man in Texas many years ago that drew a butcher, butcher knife on me in his, in his home. I was there to try to talk to him. His wife was a member of my church and his uh, mother-in-law. And uh, he was given up to be about the meanest man in, in Smith County. And uh, his wife, uh, it scared her to death when I went out to visit him. I had my music director with him. John, I may take you on one of these calls. I think that would... You know, but uh, this man came on in and he was cursing me and went on into his kitchen. I went on into the kitchen, talked to him, and I had my New Testament and I started. I said, well, let me read a verse of Scripture. And he said, you read one blank and a blank word out of that book and I'm going to cut your throat. Well, I went ahead and read John 3, 16. And he stood with a knife drawn I was younger than he was. I figured I could duck under the, the table, the breakfast table, and, and uh, uh, figured that I could get out. I just enjoyed, uh, you know, we didn't have television those days. I mean, and I knew he wasn't bluffing. I knew he meant what he said. But he drew that butcher knife on me. Uh, he was condemned. A few weeks later, a couple of months later, I met him in front of a garage one day, and he came up to me, he was about six feet, four or five, and he didn't look at me. And you know, a dog that won't look at you won't bite you. You've got to learn the traits of animals and human beings. He was looking off and he said, Reverend, Reverend, I want, I, I want to ask you, uh, would you forgive me for what I said to you? And he was shaking just like he uh, was experiencing an earthquake, and he was in his soul. And you know, a few days later, the man got saved. He was condemned when he drew that butcher knife on me, but he got under conviction because of what he had done. 
Now, go to Acts chapter 9. If you go to Acts chapter 9 and in verse 6, there was a man who also was a murderer. And uh, this man I have referred to was a murderer. He'd killed several people. He was a rancher. And he wasn't, a, he wasn't a nice person at all. All right, now, here's another murderer. His name is Saul of Tarsus. He was a rabbi. And uh, he was smitten to the ground on the road to Damascus. And uh, a light from heaven shone brighter than the noonday sun. And a voice spake to him out of, ha- out of heaven said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. And you know what uh, Saul of Tarsus said? Now watch it. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Verse 6. There's conviction. He said, You go on to, into town, and there's a street called Straight, and, and you go to that house, and I will tell thee how great things you will suffer for my name's sake. That's conviction. Do you know the difference between being condemned? That means when you get caught, Judas, he got caught, he was condemned. There's a difference. An old-fashioned Bible conviction is different from somebody who has been condemned for their, uh, their lifestyle. And you see, when you're condemned, you're trying to cover up all the time. And it's hard when you're condemned because you start lying and you co- you try to lie to cover up another lie. And after a while, it'll catch up with you. That's why I think Jesse Jackson's a hypocrite. Talk about the Jewish people up in New York and then get on Martin Schott's case. I mean, if a man's going to have... If he, if he wants John Rawlings to believe in him, uh, bitter water and sweet water can't come forth out of the same fountain. Now that's pretty plain, isn't it? But I'm, you know what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to help young people to be able to walk through all of the trash, trash talking, and say, is that man real? Is that woman real? You know, I was talking to a young man, he's a wild youngster, just a while back, I want you young people to listen to this. Where you have confidence in somebody. You know what that young man said to me? He said, well, Reverend Rawlings, he said, I know. Now, he was condemned. He said, I know I haven't lived right. And I've lived like thousands of other young people. And he went ahead and relate some of the things. But you know what? He said, Reverend, I want you to know that I had one of the best mothers that a boy could ever have. That mother's in heaven now. He didn't tell me that, but he went ahead to relate that that was true. And I saw his face sober up, and that look in his face, because young people, there was someone in that wild prodigal son's life that had an effect on him. My mother was the best woman that ever lived. Thank God for good mothers. You see what I'm talking about? That, a boy uh, like that, he may go out yonder in the wilderness and wander in the quagmire of sin and in the hog pen and the bars and the houses of prostitution, but in his soul he knows that there was a woman that crossed his life that loved him and sacrificed for him, and he has the utmost sublime faith in that one that lived what she professed. And that's what's wrong with our society today. So many of our youth, they, do, they cannot reach out to anyone that they can genuinely have confidence in. Outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I was in a citywide meeting in Collegeville a number of years, a good many years ago. Herb was leading the singing for me at that time. My wife and I on Sunday morning visited a Baptist church and... Uh, I'd been asked to speak in one of the local churches because there was a good many churches supporting the meeting. I said, no, I'd prefer just visiting. And I went to a church that was not even supporting the meeting. And, and that highly educated Baptist 
minister, so-called, spent the whole, and it was youth day in that church, uh, criticizing the Word of God and finding fault with it, and those beautiful young people in that auditorium, I thought, I, I really, I really had to hold myself down, and, and I, I got scared, I was afraid my wife was going to get up and start, but we made a vow that uh, if we ever in another service like that, that we'd speak out in behalf of our Lord, in behalf of His Word. Not long after that, I had to do it in a crisis situation. But I'm going to tell you people something. I want you to get it now. Condemnation is one thing, and deep Bible conviction is something else. And the Apostle Paul had Bible conviction, and he, he was condemned, but he was also convicted in the fact he knew he was fighting God, and he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? I believe right then and there that he had a Bible, what we generally refer to as a Bible conversion, and the fact that he got saved. That's a better term. And you know, this is another thing, beloved people. It's amazing how many people today of the liberal sort, they, uh, they know that word saved. They're, they're afraid of it. It's a Bible word. I said to a woman minister in this town the other day, I said, uh, tell me about when you got saved. She went deer hunting, grouse hunting. She went to a millinery shop. She went everywhere in the world, but to the point of her conversion. So I guess she hadn't had one. You get what I mean? Are you able to say, uh, Reverend, I I don't remember the date or the hour necessarily, but I know uh, when I got saved because I was there. Amen? Do you know that? Listen, if you don't know it, then you better get something real quick because you're going to need it when the hour of crisis comes. Can you honestly say, I know, I know whom I believe. I know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. I'm trusting in Him. That's how you know. I can say that on television, on radio, in, a, in any kind of a meeting, because as a teenager, I passed from death unto life. I asked God to save my soul. And you know what? He did. He surprised me. But he did. Uh, I wasn't expecting it, but I got it. I didn't know what happened, but a little later on I did. When I called upon the name of the Lord, it got saved. Why is that so hard for people to say? Why don't you practice this week telling people, I've been saved by the precious blood of the Lamb? That'll help your testimony. Did you, do you remember what I read? Either make the tree good and it fruit good. Or make it evil, make it corrupt, and the fruit corrupt. Quit being a hypocrite. Boy, it really gets quiet, doesn't it? That's really what God, I'm paraphrasing it. Do you know, do you know whom you believed? Paul said he did. Have you passed from death unto life? Where there was darkness, is there light? Where there was doubt, there's peace. Oh, listen, beloved, peace like a river will flood your soul when you get genuinely New Testament saved. And that's why it's important. I'm preaching to some people right now. You've, you've never been to the cross. You're as religious as these Pharisees, but being religious is not going to get the job done. Now, wait a minute. Let me show you. Everything, whether the infidels believe it or not, it revolves around this book. If I want to know who started time, I go to this book. If I want to know how long man's been upon the earth, I go to this book. If I want to know how to treat my mother, I go to this book. If I want to know how to treat my neighbor, I go to this book. If I want to know some dietary laws that's good for me, I'll go to this book. It's amazing. This is not a book on diet. Jane Fonda didn't write it. But this book tells me how to live. This book tells me how to treat you. And this book tells me when I see hypocrisy in high low and low places to speak out against it. I don't care if it's in politics 
or if it's in religion or where it is. I said to one of the uh, top religious leaders in this city, he and I were having lunch together, he's not of my religion, and I said to him, tell me about when you got saved. You don't want to mess with me if you don't want me to ask you that question. Amen? You may be a lawyer, a doctor. I said to a doctor the other day in the hospital, I said, doctor, tell me when you got saved. He got out of that room, he was doctor of one of my members. He got out so quick, he didn't know why he came in there in the first place. Why does it upset you? Tell me when you got saved. Tell me about it. If I ask you if you go to a certain place, have you ever been to Hawaii? Have you been to New York City? Have you been to Tokyo? And people will tell you. I've never embarrassed anyone saying, have you ever been to Paris? You know, it's amazing that we'll talk about this, that, and other things. Well, tell me about when you got saved. Now, I didn't say when you got baptized up here. Come on. There's a world of difference between getting baptized and being saved. S-A-V-E-D. All right, now, the word test. I'm talking about a Bible word. Can you, can you pass the test? I can. I've told you repeatedly. I know when I got saved. I know when Jesus Christ saved my soul, put my name in the Lamb's book of life, the Holy Ghost of God came to live in this old corrupt body, and I know that when my days are over, I'm going right on into heaven. Got it made, brother. Got it made. You said, man, I'd like to have a religion like that. You can get it. Didn't cost me anything. Debt's already been paid. You're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. It'll help all of us if you began to say, I know what I got to say. Now, we live in a time when uh, 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 humor or when people, I don't know, they get upset. You can say good morning to some people and they scowl at you. It's an amazing thing. A person said to me about this cartoon about the uh, religious right capturing the Republican Party and had those rights out there. said, Dr. John, doesn't that bother you? I said, no. We had a scripture in the country where I came from, and the scripture reads like this. Just consider the source. Now, I don't know exactly what book that's in, but it's good. And it'll tell you exactly like it is. Doesn't bother me. Doesn't bother me at all. I'm an old-fashioned, down-home, honest-to-God fundamentalist, believe in the blood of Jesus Christ, and I don't care how many newspaper people interview me, that's where I stand. Doesn't bother me. You say, well, they're liable to criticize you. That doesn't hurt either. Well, don't consider the source. You know, I, you know what I say? Uh, the tree's corrupt, so the fruit has to be corrupt. Amen? So I just say corrupt fruit and put it in the junk heap, and that's it. And when this world's on fire, I'll still be living. And my enemies that hate the gospel I preach will be burning in hell. It's not all over yet. The show, the fat lady is yet to sing. That'd be nice if we had a fat angel. Maybe there's not male and female. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, just thought about that when that's not in the sermon. Now, there is another word I want to use. I said, say, let's go to Luke chapter 22 and verse 32. And the Lord said to Simon Peter, when thou art converted. Now, he said, Peter, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Now this is for saved people. Peter was already saved. He didn't get saved again. You can't be born again twice or three times. That, that only happens one time. I was born physically once. I was born spiritually once. So I've had a dual birth, but one is physical and the other spiritual. Now he said to Simon Peter, when, I, when thou art converted, that is, uh, there are several synonyms you could use for that word converted. Uh, you know, change courses. Grow up maybe would be a good uh, term. 
But when you get out of this condition, this backslidden condition you're in, you're going to be qualified to talk to some other people. You will strengthen the brethren. Now, you know, I, 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 can have, I can have relationship with that statement because here's the thing. When we start out, uh, we're all pretty weak. Uh, you know, when I first got saved, I told you I didn't know what had happened to me for a couple of hours or so. All right, now, then I found out I got saved and things began to happen. And, and then two years later, when I got baptized, I got the victory over disobedience. And, and then I struggled for a period of time until I fully surrendered to preach the gospel. Then I made another move up, upward. I've been converted several times. I got converted about baptism because my Sunday school teacher was a Methodist. And uh, she didn't uh, brainwash me with sprinkling. Because I just knew better when the Bible said baptize, it didn't say sprinkle. And I, I figured it, that meant to be put down in a grave because I read in Romans 6 that we're buried with him in baptism. So I just took the Bible for what it said. So I got converted. I got converted whenever I surrendered to preach. So I've been strengthening the brethren. You know what? Let me just say this. It bothers me whenever I see some of my landmark Baptist members, like this little guy we had up here on the platform a while ago and had that pacifier in his mouth. Uh, I, I guess I've had to carry so many pacifiers for Baptists that I just resent pacifiers. Because I've been pacifying Baptists for I God only knows how long. I believe in giving them something. Amen? I mean... Something that will grow you in the grace of God to where you, you have faith in the Word of God and faith in this book. And you do, you do not doubt the Word of the living God. When you're converted, strengthen the brethren. And you know you Christians, my brothers and sisters, what in the name of God don't you get out of a state of indifference and, uh, and uh, not bearing any fruit and begin to do something. Become active. Use your skills for the glory of God and not be satisfied to just sin, but have a meaningful experience for God in, in service. Let your life bring forth fruit that your fruit might remain. And I might quote John 15 and verse 16 where it said, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go Notice that word, go, and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. God's interested in fruit. He's very concerned about fruit. You know, I, every year I'm out in Washington State, and I enjoy the Yakima Valley where they have those apple orchards that are absolutely indescribably beautiful. And I usually try to bring back a box of those apples every year. <coughs> They are just out of this world, ripened on the trees. They're really something. Fruit, fruit. Have you ever been up in Michigan where they have these blueberry fields, and gather those blueberries and all like that? Listen, fruit is really something. Now, I want you to see one other thing in Second Corinthians 9, verse 27. Paul said, lest thou should become a castaway. 